What do you no, think of what do you think of the drone uh, programs that we're doing these days? This is a completely different topic now. What do you want me to think about it? As a concert, you know, I used to teach constitutional law. Yeah. And and history. And as an historian, I worry a little bit about executive power to put people on prescription lists. There's a lot of executive power with that, uh, including, and it, as far as I can tell, there's no, uh, no limit on whether you even could kill American citizens on U.S. soil uh, with these things. Well, that was what Mr. Paul got, was a declaration from the attorney general that you can't. Yeah. And that, for that, I admire. I mean, it was a little silly to stand there for 24 hours and it talk worked. all the time in the Senate. But his point was that he wanted a formal statement from the executive denying itself that power. Right. And that, I think, is important. You know how Cicero died? I do not. Cicero is, is in some respects, the, the embodiment of what most people think was good in the Roman Republic. He said, we must destroy Carthage. That's all I well, remember. No, no, that was Cato. The oh, Cato, elder, that's right. Other, that's <laughs> I know. But Cicero was a... Was a he was a rhetorician. A, a, middle, a middle class, yes, a rhetorician. And he was a new man. He was not from one of the old ruling families of Rome. He was consul in the time of the Catalinian Rebellion. That's right. And he was just considered a great statesman. And if you, like me, I had to take Latin in, in high school. We read Cicero in the second year, along with Caesar. But after Julius Caesar was assassinated, Mark Antony and Octavius, Caesar's nephew, were taking over. And they made a list of people who would be killed on sight called a prescription list. These are enemies of the people and they're to be killed. Uh, Antony's wife insisted that Antony be put on it, uh, that, that, um, that, that Cicero be put on it because he'd insulted her once. Oh. So now imagine the 20th century and the same thing and you get what I'm afraid of. Yeah. You get to the point where an emperor who has the power to just say, that guy annoys me. Right. And and a Roman soldier, Cicero's last words were to the soldier who had found him. And he was, he said, young man, there is nothing proper about what you are about to do, but I hope you will do a proper job of it. That's uh, pretty brave in the face of uh, but, certain but, death. But more than that, it's a, it's a significant thing to think about because the military will do a proper job of what they're told to do. Oh, yeah. Which is why you want a constitution. What, well, that was what Ron always after it. He wanted a formal declaration general that the president of the United States does not have the power to order the killing of an American citizen on American soil w without some kind of due process. You, you will understand that when it comes to the opposite case of it. Uh, and we went through all this in the Civil War, you know. There were, Amer there were American advocates of the south in the north and the military tried to arrest them and take them out and hang them and the supreme court basically said you can't do that mm -hmm. you have to at least you you have to essentially hold them to the end of the war well that's fine on american soil uh, i have no objection to blowing some american who's decided he's an enemy of the united states and who's off in yemen I don't have any cops in Yemen who can go out and arrest him, if you see what I'm getting at. Yep, yep. I, I just want there to be some process. If you're going to have Americans put on a, on a list of people who can be killed on sight, I think there ought to be a decision by more than just the president one afternoon because his wife nagged him. It seems so little to ask. Do you remember Heath Kitts? Oh yeah, of course. It, in those days, you could buy from Heath Kit. You could you could buy actually a computer kit, but mostly they were radio transmitters and right. you know ham stuff. And um, they they had in the in the early days, Heath Kit actually would sell you a uh, kit to make your own television set, <laughs> which was if you built it would have been a little better than what you could get down at there wasn't any best buys in those days but to make company or a department store you could go down there and buy a television set well the heath kit one was a little better and um john wanted to have a robot make it 
So he ordered one. So the kit came, and the graduate students were looking at the boy. That's wonderful. Let's open this up and see what we have to do. And John said, no, 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 no. We want the robot to open the case and take it out and inspect the parts and then start building it. Well, 10 years later, he hadn't got a robot that could open the case. Yeah. Uh, everything yeah. goes slow, and then suddenly it goes fast. Right. Then suddenly there are automated uh, assembly lines. Right. and um, I mean, America manufactures more stuff now than it did 10 years ago, but there are far fewer manufacturing jobs than there used to be. It's all made by machines. It's If you can do a repetitive task. On the other hand, there was a, I suppose it's considered uh, politically incorrect now, but there was a common phrase in the robot industry that um, you never understand how smart a moron is until you try to program a robot. <laughs> it's true. A moron can walk, can recognize and, faces. And can follow a great number of instructions yeah. without having you translate them into little movement at a right. time. Move this hand, this 221 centimeters and no further and at Soter. You don't have to do that. You can tell the guy to pick it up. You can update it, Jerry. Say a four-year-old. Now, that would be politically correct. Uh, actually, no. Four-year-old would be an idiot. I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> I mean, th you understand. These pick were the age you want. <laughs> these were definitions that were taught us in graduate I school. I remember, yeah. Normal psychology. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, an idiot has a mental age of under four. Yeah. Four or under, and an, an adult or a person of near adult years. And uh, an imbecile is one of an adult age between five and, um, I think, ten. And a, um, a moron is one ten to twelve. I think they've taken those definitions out of the DSM. Oh, they've taken them out because they consider them <laughs> insulting now. But uh, they were perfectly reasonable definitions. Is this a time. word? Yeah. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, now they talk about dull, normal, right. and mentally challenged. And right. the, the thing is that when you're talking about an imbecile, he ain't going to understand what word you're using to begin with. So it, you're not insulting him, if you see what I mean. You're insulting somebody who thinks he ought to be insulted. But then that's there are a lot of people in this world who spend their lives getting unhappy on the part of other people, even though what you do doesn't make them unhappy, they think it makes somebody else unhappy. And I suppose we need people like that. I'm just not one of them. What do you think of Google Glass? You want uh, these glasses now? Did, uh... No. No, not I don't. for you. Maybe somebody would want them, but I don't. No. How about um, just uh, thinking of some of the genomics? I mean, we're seeing some amazing uh, steps forward in genomics. I think some have said, I know Bill Gates believed this, that the next revolution, you know, post-information revolution is going to be a genomics revolution. Yeah. I, Bill's, Bill is an amazing man. He thinks of a lot of things, and he thinks pretty deeply about them. Sometimes he gets way off base, and he gets stuck off base for a while. And uh, But he comes up with some awfully good stuff, too. And my heaven, he spent the last years of his life giving his money away he'll keep enough to be happy but he's already publicly said he's not going to leave his kids more than about five million bucks each that if they can't live on that they they that's too bad that's actually smart that's there's nothing that debilitates somebody more than the knowledge that you don't ever have to make well, your way in the world in my generation the the, the example was barbara hutton she the was Woolworths millionaire she was uh she was let us say she had an interesting career. The Paris Hilton of her time. Uh, yes, and, and then some. Yes, yeah. <laughs> There's always been one. What about, so the chat room's asking me uh, to ask you about various technologies. Autonomous vehicles. You want a car that drives itself? At my age, yes. <laughs> I, I talk too much. No, you, no, no, you do not. You talk well, just right. I was caught up in radio. <laughs> That's and right. Literally, I mean, my first, my, my father was the manager of WHBQ in, in Memphis, Tennessee. Right, safe. And we lived in the Gayoso Hotel, which is where the 
the station was that was part of what what we got during the depression as um, as 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 part of his salary and um i was on the air at age four or five and intermittently after that and you sort of learn when you're doing that that there's no dead time well if somebody doesn't leap in see right there yep. see, <laughs> somebody doesn't leap in to say something you do it because do there it. should be no dead air it's really yeah. a, a flaw of mine that i've been trying to overcome because i have had i've been in radio since 76 and you're exactly right no dead air and I have to remember, sometimes it's okay to let it to pause. <laughs> <laughs>